my family were mostly gay guys who were my babysitters and the guys who, you know, took the pictures at my birthday parties. And I felt like I had this amazing family. I called them my aunties. And it was a really wonderful, amazing world that came crashing down. Starting in 82, the first person I knew died of AIDS. Um, A young guy named Steve. And how old were you at the time? I was 10 when he was diagnosed. I remember I was on the beach at Fire Island, and I saw him, and he was covered in these purple spots. And I remember asking my dad, like, what's wrong with Steve? And my dad said, oh, he has this skin cancer called Kaposi's sarcoma. And I said, well, what is that? And my dad said, well, nobody really knows, but there's some gay men that are getting it. And within, I think, two months, Steve was dead. And it was pretty much a succession of deaths of my family throughout the next decade. My stepdad, Bill, died in 87. My dad died in 91 after a really grueling six months of me taking care of him. You know, I was 19 and was on a break from college and exhausted from taking care of my dad. And I called up my auntie, Eddie. I said, can you help? And within, I don't know, a week, he'd organized 40 people to do round-the-clock shifts. He was the only other person in the room with me and my mom when my dad died. At that point, everyone had died except for a handful of stragglers who I now hold near and dear to my heart, my aunties. It was a powerful family. There was a lot of love. And they modeled for me how to, how to survive an epidemic even if you were dying while doing it. Good evening on this June 17th. I am so happy you're able to join us this evening. Have we got a great show for you tonight? Oh my gosh, I want to welcome you all. I know some of you are watching us on Facebook, some on YouTube, and possibly even a couple on Twitch. So, you know, today is kind of a monumental day in history. Um, we now have a federal holiday for June fi- um, Juneteenth, which is a celebration of the emancipation of African American slaves that really started in this that really started off in Texas, and today was signed in as a federal holiday by our president Joe Biden. So very happy that that has now been enacted. Um, I know I have friends that um, the corporations they work for have already started offering a day off for this coming weekend which is kind of nice because it's celebrated it's celebrated on June 19th with this year is on a Saturday. Um, it is also, uh, so back in the Fox Theater, which opened its doors down in Tucson back in 1930, um, is our only Southwestern Art Deco movie palace in the entire state. And it closed its doors for good, basically on this date back in 1974. It then sat vacant for 25 years and became, got to a point where it was almost unsalvageable, but the city of Tucson decided they needed to do something with this. And so they rallied the troops and after a six year renovation, they were able to reopen the theater back in 2005. And they just announced the end of last month that they are going to be opening up for live performances. So that's very exciting. It is also National Mascot Day. And here in Arizona, we have a slew of mascots, everything from the Gorilla Suns 
for the Phoenix Suns, Baxter for the Diamondbacks, Big Red for the Cardinals, Sparky for ASU, Scorch for the Mercury, Dusty for the Tucson Roadrunners, Wilbur and Wilma, Wildcat for U of A, as well as, don't forget the Lumberjacks of NAU, and even Bumstead the Bear, which actually started off as a real bear for Phoenix College. Um, you know, and I never knew GCU had, I knew it was an antelope, but until today, I didn't realize that its name was Thunder the Antelope. Um, you also have, I think probably one of the most unique, which is for Scottsdale Community College and is an artichoke. Um, it is also Accordion National Awareness Month. So accordions have been found in all kinds of music ranging from jazz to zydeco, folk, gospel, blues, and norteño, and kind of everything else. It is also National Eat Your Veggies Day. So I hope you've had your daily dose of something green or orange or something that grew with roots in the ground. So it's an exciting day today. What can you expect if this is your first time watching? Well, we're going to have an amazing guest on, which you'll know more about in just a few minutes. We have a little bit of music history. We always talk about a small town in Arizona. We also have a beverage for the night, as well as we do a little bit of show and tell, pretty much because this is, this is my living room and I have a lot of stuff and it's all got stories attached to it. So it's a chance to actually share some of those stories all about Arizona. Now, if this is your first time here, so my name is Marshall Shore, and I got here basically a little over 21 years ago. I was working in a Carnegie building um, back in Brooklyn Public Library and realized, you know, I had had enough of snow, of slush, of chilly winds, which you're not going to find today here, and decided it was time for a change. So traded that for a little library in South Phoenix that had this rich oral tradition of kind of how the community had evolved to where it was today. And, you know, they are now in a beautiful, pretty brand spanking new building as libraries are starting to open up again as well, which is very exciting being able to go stand amongst all those books and do some research. Now, to get from New York to here, we had to load everything up into a U-Haul. And, you know, their International World Headquarters are right here in Arizona. Now, when we moved here, we promptly moved into a beautiful 1956 ranch. And the goal is to keep the house to period. Now, when we moved in, it was painted brick, but it was painted beige. And lots of beige. I am happy to say now it is just two-tone of seafoam and cantaloupe. And there's what my kitchen looks like today. All that buttercream yellow tile, that mahogany veneered cabinetry with that great 1956 patina on it. Now, when I got here, all I really heard people say was there was no history here. But I knew that wasn't true because every time I went for an adventure, whether it was on my bike, on foot, in a car, I came across so many amazing people, places, and stories. And that's one of the reasons why I started doing exactly what I'm doing. But then you also have that post-war boom that I think in a lot of ways made the Arizona that we all know and love today. All those GIs that either were stationed here, trained here, or passed on the way to somewhere else. And after the war, they were moving here in huge numbers for a whole new way of life. And we'll even talk about maybe how some of those folks even got here later on. Um, earlier this week with the Bisbee Library, we did a program virtually. Sadly, it was not in Bisbee. Um, we were already working on a date next year where we basically talked about LGBTQ history right here in Arizona. And then did a podcast earlier this week as well um, with the Arizona Republic for Valley 101, which is an amazing podcast. They cover a wide variety of topics. So it's a lot of fun to go and listen to. And so we did one with them on LGBTQ history because, of course, June is LGBTQ history month. And we have a lot to celebrate. Now, here's how you can 
Ah, uh, thank you, Pam. I'm glad you enjoyed the Bisbee show. So you can always reach out to me. I see some of you have found the chat off to the side. You can also reach out to me via Facebook, Instagram, even good old fashioned email works. And I just realized I probably should update my website seeing that. I'm like, oops, I don't think I've done that in a while. Now, if you're watching on Facebook, I will ask you to share. There's a little button at the bottom that says share. Click on that so that way all your friends can get to see how much fun we're having with Arizona history. So we're going to talk about a little town in Arizona. And this is Donnie Park, which is up in Coconino County. It's a population of a little over 5,300. It was founded back in 1930. Now it's fame named for Ben Dooney, who was a Civil War. Um, he actually fought in, with the Navy and was on one of the ironclad ships called the Benton. And he wound up moving to Arizona, working up in Flagstaff, working with railroad construction, as well as helping to build roads for the Arizona Lumber and Timber Company. He homesteaded about 150 plus acres in an area that is called Donnie Park. And it still is called that today for him. Now, he did serve in as mayor for Flagstaff back in the early 1900s. He was also had been a miner and a prospector. He was the first, as we know, the first. Oh, I'm pronouncing it wrong. OK, Donnie. Ah, uh, okay. Well, you know, it's funny because I actually found various spellings. Um, I found it without an E some places. So I'm not really, so it's always interesting. Um, I've noticed that in the last few weeks is people keep adding in or taking out E's. And so that's always one of the fun of researching history is you've got to look and think of how other ways could a name have been spelled. So basically, so Doni when he was up in Flagstaff, was the first Anglo to see the Wapataki ruins. And so he actually led archaeological expeditions with the Smithsonian into those ruins. Now, back in 33, he actually was out moving some firewood one day, slipped, hit his head, and passed away from exposure. Now you can see his cabin, which has been relocated up to the Arizona Historical Society to their Pioneer Museum. So you can still get a chance to see a, the, his homestead. And here is what that National Monument looks like. Now, one of the really interesting things is there is a blowhole that either blows cool air out or sucks air. And you can see there is one of the park rangers floating her hat on that. Um, they don't really know what purpose it would have held, but it's just a really cool thing on a hot summer day to find this cool air rushing out of the ground. And this um, area was also ancestors of the Hopi, Zuni, and other Pueblo peoples built the citadel and the Pueblos around here. You also, this park has, is famous for its view of the San Francisco Peaks, as well as Cinder Crater, which was used by NASA when they were getting ready to go to the moon. They did testing here, going out and making it look just like the moon. As well as Eldon Pueblo, where you can go see, um, this was a major trading system where they have found jewelry from the coast of California, throughout Mexico. And so it is very much an educational and research site. And now we talk about why is it a happy hour? Well, you know, PJ always comes with a beverage. Um, his staff today is actually in Flagstaff because they are getting ready to brew their very own custom brew up at one of our favorite breweries, Mother Road. And so today we are talking a little bit about the brew that is called Conserve and Protect, which actually raises money for wildlife preservation. And so, you know, there's a lot of wildlife and we'll talk about some of that wildlife that you might have seen maybe with your thumb out as you moved along the roads. 
So let me see if I can. Oh, there we go. And there's Bob, my silent bartender. Oh, see, I'm really bad at pouring this. Okay, I'm going to have to let some of that foam die down because that's a lot, a lot of foam. And you don't mean to drink all that and then try to talk because it will be unpleasant. So we're just going to let that do its thing. All right. And so, through the miracle of modern technology, whether it's mobile in a car, stationary in your house, we are bringing on our very special guest, Jack Reed. Oh, and let me get rid of my bartender because nobody needs to see him anymore. All right, there we go. Well, hello, Jack. How are we doing, Marshall? I am good, and yourself? Doing excellent. Happy to be here. I, I was loving the uh, Northern Arizona history lesson there. <laughs> well, because you recommended Do um, Dony Park, and I was, and it was like, it was just amazing. It's like this one little place just had all this history. Yeah, it, it's a it's a beautiful view of Mount Eldon and the peaks from there. I have some friends that live in the area, so I think they'll get a kick out of watching this <laughs> and going, "Hey, I know right where that is." Yeah, Lupaki is an excellent spot too. Uh, they do midnight bike rides when it's a full moon from Sunset Crater down this big incline all the way. I want to say it's like 20 miles down to Lupaki and you do it in the full moon and it's it's well lit. So it's kind of a cool little adventure down there. Um, oh, very cool. Little insider tip there. Indeed. So tell us a little about yourself. Yeah, so um, I uh, was a history professor for about five years. I now work at NAU in a student affairs position, but I love to write. So I published a book called Roadside Americans, the history of hitchhiking in American culture. Um, I, as a young person, love to travel, love to hit the road, go to concerts around, go on backpacking trips with friends. Um, and when I was in New Zealand, when I did, just graduated from college, I moved there and did this program called Woofing where you work on organic farms. And so I was working on these farms for about four hours and then they give you a place to stay and food. And so I had bought a car there um, and I was traveling around New Zealand working on these different farms for about five months. And um, when I was there, there was all these young people backpacking around and hitchhiking. So I just thought that was kind of fascinating. And I would pick them up and kind of talk to them if I felt like it was safe. Uh, eventually I got home and talked to my dad who grew up in the seventies and I was talking about, man, there's all these people hitchhiking. And he's like, yeah, I used to do that, you know? And then he told me how my grandfather used to hitchhike in the thirties and forties. And so it just kind of sparked this interest in me where it wasn't even on my radar growing up. I was pretty adventurous. I'm wandering around this country. That's not mine sleeping in strangers homes and working on their farms. But the idea of getting into a stranger's car hadn't really crossed my mind. So it's kind of this breakthrough of like, I want to study this and, and kind of why this happened. Um, and along the way, I, I was it, it was a story that was about a lot of like white middle class people and hobos and stuff. But I wanted to know more about, you know, people of, you know, people of color, how they got around. Did they ever hitchhike? And so I started researching, um, you know, African-Americans on the road. And that led me into this oral history archive at Klein Library, in Northern Arizona University, and discovered this really great nest of stories of oral histories of probably about 20 African-American migrants from the South who came to Northern Arizona. It's part of the lumber industry uh, in the 30s and 40s. So that became this kind of cool story. And so I guess what I, I became is this, this historian of kind of the road and how people get around and, and mobility in American culture in that way. So it's been a, a fun ride. Well, one of the things I loved is just talking to even my mom about the topic of hitchhiking it suddenly she launched in these all these stories about her younger brother um yeah. after the military it was like he wanted to go see more of the country and didn't have a car didn't have the funds to buy one and so he just hitchhiked across the country yeah and e even in uh you know allied europe once paris was liberated uh a soldier wrote home to wisconsin that you know he hitchhiked all the way into paris on various tanks and military uh hardware and got to just hang out in Paris and hitchhike. There was a lot of hitchhiking done during the war itself, which World War II, which is kind of fascinating. 
Yeah. So um, for those who have seen the show, I mean, you know, we're getting ready to launch into some trivia. And the beauty is, I think, of our trivia is it's not that we go through the answers and then we're done. It's the fact that Jack will then go through the answers and explain them to us. So they are multiple choices. Even if you don't know what the answer is, you know, it's one of those. It's one of those choices. And so just pick a letter. Now you can keep track of that however you want, whether it is on your forearm with a magic marker, whether it is a pad of paper. Some folks keep track of it in the chat. So you can do whatever makes you happy. It's all good. All right. So our first question is, what in the world was Arizona's Hitchhike College? A, an institution in the 70s, Tucson that trained hitchhikers about local laws. B, a nickname for a depression era labor camp in Phoenix. B, a nickname for Phoenix area jail cells back in the 60s. D, a moniker for ASU back in the 60s. So what was Hitchhike College? And I think they're going to be surprised by the answer. All right. Question two. What happened when the Tucson City Council proposed a law to banish, oh, to punish both hitchhikers and drivers for participating in ride solicitation back in December of 1970? A, the University of Arizona students successfully protested the measure and it did not pass. B, the proposed law was passed and remains effective in stopping the practice to this very day. C, the bill passed, but police officers rarely enforce the law. Or D, the bill did not pass, but another version was passed five years later. So what happened in Tucson when they proposed a law about hitchhikers and drivers? All right, question three. Who were the predominant hitchhikers in the city of Phoenix during the 1960s? A, hobos. B, teenage boys and girls. C, families. Or D, the elderly. Who were the hitchhikers back in Phoenix back during the 60s? All right, and you see the photo of this gentleman. What did this particular hitchhiker passing through Arizona along Route 66 name his dog? Was it A, Dylan, B, Buzz, C, Canyon, or D, Tripper? Which one of those do you think that dog was named by a hitchhiker passing through Arizona? Question five. The Arizona State Hitchhiking Law in 1967 required A, absolutely no hitchhiking, B, individuals seeking lifts to remain off the paved roadway, C, individuals to flag rides from specific hitchhiking stations, or D, individuals to face traffic when, flag, when flagging lifts. All right, so which of those was required by an Arizona State hitchhiking law? And we're coming down the from that camel's hump. All right, six. Which town or city in Arizona was known for policing hitchhiking the toughest back in 1960s? Was it A, Flagstaff, B, Tucson, C, Kingman, or D, Phoenix? What place in Arizona was the toughest on hitchhiking back in the 60s? Question seven. Which state did African Americans who moved to Flagstaff in the 30s and 40s typically move from? Was it A, Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina, B, Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi, C, Georgia, and Alabama, or D, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Tennessee. So where did African-Americans coming to Northern Arizona 
where did they come from back in the 30s and 40s? Wilson Riles, who migrated to Flagstaff, Arizona, and graduated from NAU University in 1940, A, served in the U.S. Army Air Forces during World War II, B, was a local music disc jockey in Flagstaff, C, was the first African American to be elected to a statewide office in California, or D, all of the above. So what do you think Wilson Riles was known for? It's one of those letters. Could it be all of the above? Could it be just one of them? We'll find out in just a bit. All right, what was the primary mode of transit that African Americans used to move from Northern Arizona in the 30s and 40s? A, an automobile, B, a train, C, hitchhiking, D, an airplane. So what were African Americans using as their primary mode of transportation back in the 30s and 40s? And what part of Flagstaff was the most common area for African American residents to live in in the 40s and 50s? Oh, 50, 40s through the 60s. All right. So was it A, Sunnyside, B, north of historic downtown, C, south of San Francisco Street, or D, Kachina Village? So where was the most common area for African Americans from the 40s to the 60s to live in? All right. So while you are prepping your answers, you know, we are going to have a little chat about some Arizona music history. And so we are going to talk about a band called, and you know, it's so funny. I'm going to probably butcher the pronunciation of this because <laughs> I was watching a Tucson station and it was like, and one of the band members pronounced it so eloquently. And so I will call it Vox Urbana. I'm sure Jack will correct my pronunciation at some point probably sounding a lot better than what I do. Um, but they started doing a project that was really collecting stories of folks coming across the border and turning those stories into cumbia songs. Now, cumbia is kind of an infectious, jaunty music that is extremely well known. And they would use this style to tell stories. And so, they were working on their album, Relatos and Caravana. And so they were really interviewing folks and retelling their stories through Cumbia. Now, one of the songs on this record actually is called Carolina. And it just tells the story of a Mexican transgendered woman who is persecuted in Mexico, decided to take refuge in the U.S., and when she got here, she was still being persecuted because of her identity. Um, they actually re did release the album, I think, less than a month ago. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's a lot of fun to listen to. I mean, I was listening to some of it. I was prepping today for tonight. So, go look them up. I mean, they're a fun band. Um, and Jack was talking about how they actually had performed, it sounds like, at Valley Bar back in the day. Hopefully, maybe Valley Bar will bring them back. As I see that I think Valley Bar just posted they were doing some events as well. All right. So who's ready for some answers? All right. What in the world was Arizona's Hitchhike College? And the answer is be a nickname for a 1934 labor camp right here in Phoenix. Yeah, absolutely. Um, kind of a fascinating story. When I was researching my book, I came across, you know, I was doing all this online research on uh, newspapers.com, came across this article and was just fascinated by the pictures. Uh, but as you can see here, it, it was a labor camp. And the problem that Arizona and specifically Phoenix officials were having in the 1930s was there's these transient out of work folks that were coming through Arizona and they would just kind of hang out in camps and it was unpopular among the local populace. And so at first, 
the state officials would try to kick them out and, and make sure they couldn't come into the state. But it's really hard because you, you have individuals riding in boxcars and hitchhiking and just jumping off forever. Um, and so what they tried to do instead during the FDR administration was to have federal labor camps. Um, and so instead of kicking these people out, they're like, all right, we'll come here. If you work for, I think, four or six hours a day, uh, we'll give you three square meals and you can have a, a place to sleep. Because a lot of these people did want to wander, but there's a bunch that just wanted some sort of situation where they could find set roots and, and get some skills and, and kind of have a place to relax and get to know people. And so uh, this Hitchhike College was kind of uh, what they nicknamed it. Uh, but it was, in fact, about 900 uh, laborers who had kind of were passing through town, uh, posted up in this area for a few months, uh, worked. They had a football team. Uh, so this article, if you if you find it, it's from the, let's see, Miami, Florida, Miami News in February 4th of 1934. Um, and it had about 900 people and they talk about kind of the football team. They keep going with this college metaphor of, you know, instead of classes, they have certain things that they can, you know, learn. And so it's this fascinating little window into that time period, but it was actually pretty effective at uh, regulating transiency in the area because instead of 900 people kind of wandering around, they were, in this park working, getting to know each other, picking up skills, maybe uh, able to find some work in the local area once they kind of get their feet underneath them. Uh, so pretty interesting idea, but many of you probably had not heard of that. It was at a local fairgrounds in uh, Phoenix where the camp was. Oh, wow. So I wonder if it was actually at the state fairgrounds. I would have to take another look. I don't know. Yeah, the I'm, I'm kind of like, it's like, I'm like, oh, I, yeah. I, should, I should ping them and see because they probably don't know that bit of their history. Yeah, so pretty interesting stuff. So indeed. Yeah, All right. So what happened when Tucson City Council proposed a law to banish, or I'm sorry, hitch punish hitchhikers? <laughs> you want to ban them? I, I know that. <laughs> well, I mean, banish, punish. I mean, they just wanted to stop it. That was their goal. <laughs> and so what happened? Yeah, so a, the University of Arizona yeah. successfully protested and the measure did not pass. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, University of Arizona students, Tucson's a pretty large, you know, spread out area. And so I think there was a, a pretty limited amount of public transit that was available. And so for students that didn't have cars, it was really hard to get around. And so hitchhiking became a really common mode of transportation for a lot of college students at U of A. Um, and so, and I want to say, yeah, 1970, when this started to be taken away, when the local city council tried to get rid of hitchhiking and, and, and make it illegal for both people picking them up and people trying to hitchhike, these students at U of A got together, created a, like an adv advocacy protest group called Hitchhike, I want to say, and hundreds of them showed up to the city council to protest the movement. I have a quote here that I want to read by one of the U of A students. Uh, it was Greg Kabat at U of A. He said, it is discriminatory against people who don't own cars and against people who have the kindness to give rides. He concluded, we don't need to legislate against human need and human kindness. And so they were able to, with their numbers, kind of overturn this bill that was going to be passed and make sure it was voted down. Uh, similar things happened, I want to say, in Santa Cruz and in places in California uh, as well. So interesting, uh, you know, the public can band together and make, make things happen. Indeed. All right. Who were predominantly hitchhikers right here in the city of Phoenix during the sixties? It was teenage boys and girls. Oh my gosh. Out hitchhiking. Yeah, it was quite a uh, controversial aspect. Uh, there was a lot of op-eds in the paper about what can we do to ruin this or get rid of the scourge? You know, our our young people are out on the road and this is terrible. But again, similar to Tucson, a lot of people pointed out that there's not a lot of public transit. And, you know, if people want to get around and they can't drive because they're pretty young um, and or don't have cars, then this is kind of a, a natural way to get around. And by the 60s and 70s, it started to have this kind of hip allure for young people. Uh, like, it's kind of cool, you know, to get out on the road and do those things. And so you could kind of brag your friends about it. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of teenage, both boys and, and young women, 
uh, would take to the road and police were really having a hard time. Uh, there was one uh, police official who said, there's really no way we can stop everyone from doing it and ticketing them. So we just try to find the people who look like criminals and, and limit them as much as possible. Hitchhiking. Um, but yeah, it was something that was concerning to a lot of people, even though the, the parents of a lot of those on the road had hitchhiked themselves, but they felt society had changed and it was no longer uh, acceptable. That said, a lot of young women hadn't hitchhiked uh, in the 30s and 40s. It was more young men, but a lot of police officers and those folks had, had hitchhiked themselves. They were uh, soldiers in World War II, and that was really common. So interesting stuff. Indeed. And now nobody hitchhikes. No, not really. All right. So what did this young man name his dog when he as he was passing along Arizona's Route 66? And it was D Tripper. <laughs> yeah. So I think have a, I, I may have a sense that he was into psychedelics. Uh, he was part of that, that movement. Uh, I, I tried to throw in some interesting distractors there, as the, the teachers among us might know that word and multiple choice questions. I'm a big Bob Dylan fan, so I tried to throw that in there. But, um, but yeah, uh, Tripper. And that was actually an interesting story. Uh, the background of that photo is that in 1972, the Environmental Protection Agency sent uh, photographers, kind of like back in the 40s with the Works Project Administration. Um, so they sent these photographers out into the West to try to capture how pollution was, was damaging the landscape to try to get some uh, popular movement behind the environmental movement. Uh, and so Tripper and uh, his, his owner were out there kind of hanging out, and I guess they just uh, came across this photographic moment and couldn't, couldn't pass it by. And now forever, ever memorialized. Yeah. I just love the name of the dog. It, it's in the, uh, photo credits. It's like, he, he's with his dog tripper. Uh, so I just, <laughs> and, and it was because he was taking a trip, but not necessarily just the hitchhiking type. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then an Arizona state law back in 67 for hitchhiking required individuals seeking lifts remain off the paved roadway. Yeah. And that kind of throws a lot of people off. They would pass these anti-hitchhiking legislation, you know, uh, or bills or laws, and it, it would say no hitchhiking. But if you read the fine print, it was like on the paved roadway. They didn't want people standing on the highway and, and kind of getting in the way of traffic and, and, and hitchhiking. But if you read the fine print, it was acceptable as long as you were off the paved roadway. So if you stood on the side of the road and hitchhiked, it's fine. Um, and so it was, it's kind of an interesting little wrinkle to that, uh, that whole situation. So um, they would... Uh, police and kind of regulatory agents would go after the folks that were on the road. But as long as you were kind of following the law, they would typically stay away from you. That said, if you look kind of like a sketchy character, uh, you know, law enforcement officials would probably try and try to find something to talk to you about. But you know, but that makes sense. Cause I'm trying to, it's like looking back at like other that movies that have hitchhiking. It's like, they're always like in the weeds off the road, which I never understood. Oh. Why were they so far off? Or you couldn't hardly even see them. That's what if there were tall weeds, but that makes sense because they were just responding to what was really going on that they couldn't be on the pavement. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of a safety measure a lot of times because you have these high speed highways and uh, people are getting in car accidents, slamming on their brakes. Uh, so there's a lot of traffic fatalities in the sixties. And so I think a lot of times there are measures for safety of motorists, not just kind of, we don't want people to hitchhike. So kind of, kind of an interesting aspect of that. Yeah. All right. So which town city in Arizona was known for policing hitchhiking the toughest in the 60s? A, Flagstaff, really? Yeah, that's that's kind of what was shocking. That, that, that's kind of yeah. shocking. I mean, given I, kind of where NAU sits now on kind of the spectrum. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's kind of this uh, left leaning area, a lot of kind of hippies in town uh, hanging out. And so yeah, I've lived here for about 11 years, and when I was researching that, I was shocked to find that there was, you know, I'd go into the old uh, student newspapers and the archives and read about what was going on, but um, I was reading Abby Hoffman's book, Steal This Book, which was kind of this countercultural uh, Bible from uh, the late 60s, uh, maybe early 70s, actually, but he has this whole section on hitchhiking, and as I was reading it, sitting in my Flagstaff apartment, uh, all of a sudden it takes a hard left turn and he's talking about, I actually have a picture in here, but he, uh, is talking about how hitchhiking 
is pretty common uh, throughout the country, but in certain areas, you, you might be known to be arrested. Some places are notorious, like Flagstaff, Arizona. And so that kind of uh, got my attention. Yeah, it wow. says once in a while you'll hear stories of fines levied or levied or even a few arrests for hitchhiking. Flagstaff, Arizona is notorious. So just kind of fascinating that because it was Route 66, there's a lot of uh, young people passing through town and the flag police, it was a more conservative town back then, really cracked down on, on transits coming through town. And it became so popular that uh, people like in Washington state would hear about this law. One guy traveling to, to Flagstaff while hitchhiking turned himself into the police and just like, hey, here's my information. Just, you know, hassle me out on the road. And they're like, how do you know this? He's like, oh, believe me, people know about Flagstaff. So it was just kind of this interesting aspect uh, the, among people on the road. They, they knew that flag wasn't messing around. Wow. So I wonder if people if people stop going to Flagstaff because of that and would then go around other ways to avoid that conflict. Yeah. In the 1970s, Colorado became the, the worst state in the, the country to hitchhike because there was these contestations over what is Colorado about? You have a lot of conservative ranchers and farmers and, and folks. And then you have all these hippies inundating the area in the back to the land movement. Uh, and so you have Hunter S. Thompson moving to Aspen back before he was all millionaires and billionaires. Um, and so all these young people start moving into the area. They outlaw hitchhiking because that was one of the main uh, ways people got around and started arresting people for like week and two week stays. Uh, and so word spread, do not hitchhike in Colorado. And it was kind of a way of turning off the faucet of people coming into the region uh, and, and trying to kind of set up shop. So it's an interesting kind of history around that. Yeah. All right. So question seven, which states did African American, American, African Americans move to Flagstaff in the thirties and forties from where? B, Texas, Louisiana and Mississippi. Yeah, it's actually East Texas. I should specify kind of along. Uh, okay. Which makes Louisiana sense. Louisiana and, and Mississippi. So that was kind of the, the big place. As you can see in this map, uh, people that were further east in the south, a lot of times went up the east coast or up to the Midwest, Chicago, Detroit, those kinds oh. of areas. And the further west you got in the south, um, folks would maybe go to Los Angeles, Phoenix, Portland, uh, various places, Oakland, San Francisco. Uh, but those folks coming through Flagstaff, I read a lot of their accounts and mainly they're from Mississippi, Louisiana, um, and East Texas. A lot of them are lumber workers. And so there were there was a lumber um, economy in the South that was starting to kind of peter out because there were uh, over the, the areas were deforested and there wasn't much money in the business anymore. And so a lot of those companies picked up from say Alco, Louisiana and bought territory in the white mountains of uh, Arizona or in Flagstaff and kind of recreated that business in Northern Arizona. Um, and a lot of their employees kind of picked up their families and moved West. Uh, so kind of an interesting history in that way. A lot of times when you hear about the Great Migration, it's like I'm leaving the rural South and I'm going to work in a uh, a major processing plant or some sort of uh, major huge factory in the North. Uh, but these people kind of kept similar lifestyle, uh, same jobs and just picked up, made a lot more money in Arizona. So interesting history on that front. Right, because I know in the past we've talked about um, McNary, which was a kind of a company town that a lot of Louisiana. Daughter, I guess, was trying to make. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! You said you had a small family. I didn't know it was that small. Right. Oh yeah. So, uh, she got a little cameo appearance. <laughs> Aww. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's been kind of fascinating um, from Margaret talking about McNary and folks moving north um, once they kind of got rid of all the lumber that was on the mountain near Sholo, then moving up. And so I think it's so fascinating. Yeah, that there's was a big place for a while. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And, there, and there's really not a lot written about it. No, not really. Um, I wrote an article about it. Um, that got some traction. I think I published it in like 2015, but yeah, it's it's a pretty interesting story that I think more people could learn about. So. I agree. Yeah, photobombed indeed, Sarah. In, in, indeed. All right, so question eight. Wilson Riles, who migrated to Flagstaff and graduated from NAU in 1940, it was all of the above. Wow, what an adventurer he was. Right. Yeah. Fascinating guy. And, and connecting to the previous question, Riles, 
actually migrated from Louisiana. So you can kind of see how that, that worked. Um, and he came in 1936 and was a student at what was then called Arizona State Teachers College. Um, he graduated in 1940. Uh, he was the first African-American student at Arizona State Teachers College, what would become Northern Arizona University. Oh. Um, he became the principal at Dunbar School, which is the school he's in in this photo right here, which was the segregated African-American school on Flagstaff South Side. Um, and so he was a, a principal there for a while and then later moved to the Bay Area to Oakland and was elected the state superintendent of public instruction in California. He was reelected in 74 and again in 78. He was given an honorary law degree, uh, PhD by NAU. Just a, a pretty cool guy. But yeah, like I was reading these oral histories and they were talking about how Wilson Riles used to spin records. I don't know, like blues records, old rock and roll uh at the time too so uh it seems like a really cool interesting fella for sure indeed so does he have it does he have an oral history that you found at nau he, he did not uh have a specific oral history but i think he is a separate oral history that you can read he has like an archival okay. his own archival collection okay, that makes at sense Montana state of library in california he's a pretty big deal um, so if you're interested in Wilson Riles, there's a lot more to learn about him. He was a pilot during World War II as well, uh, which is pretty rare. A lot of African-American soldiers didn't get that opportunity. So right. um, fascinating individual, and I, I highly suggest looking into him. We have a building on NAU's campus called Riles. There's a road in uh, Flagstaff called Riles. So he's, he's left an imprint on this area and also Oh, California. wow. Yeah. Very cool. All right. So what was the primary mode that African-Americans used to get around Northern Arizona in the 30s and 40s? And I, I like how it's like, I'm sure I know I probably would have put hitchhiking because that was the topic. But no, yeah. it is A, the train. Yeah. And then I threw the car in here just to further confuse people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of folks uh, in the 30s and 40s didn't necessarily own automobiles. Um, so within the black community. And so the train was really convenient because Flagstaff located right along the train. So a lot of folks would, you know, grab the train in Texas or Louisiana and head West on that. Um, those that did drive, some folks did drive, obviously uh, a lot of times they would carpool, you know, so the workers, the, the male head of family would typically head out first and look for work out West. And then maybe four of them would go together in a car. Okay. And then once they found work, they would bring the family uh, along later. But yeah, in a lot of these oral histories, most of them took, took the train, which I, I found interesting because you just, the United States is such this car oriented place. I just pictured, but during world war II, there were no automobiles made. It was all military uh, equipment. And so there's a big uh, decline in automobile usage during the 1940s um, because of this. There were no new automobiles made, so uh, no new consumers could get them. There was a huge boom in the 1920s for automobile uh, purchases, but in the 1930s, that kind of declined because of the Great Depression and few people being able to afford cars. And so there's kind of a plateau in the number of cars uh, purchased through the 30s and 40s. And then it really took off in the 50s uh, once the economy really recovered in the post-war years. Well, and then there, um, here in Arizona, there's a little town that was known as Mobile. That oh. was pretty much an African-American centric town. Oh. And it was there because it was basically the staff for the railroad. That's fascinating. Yeah, exactly. So you can kind of piece together this history uh, through that. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. And today there's really nothing left other than there's an elementary school left with the name Mobile and then historic cemetery as well. All right. All right. And here we are at our last question, number 10. What part of Flagstaff was the most common area for African Americans to live in during the 40s and to the 60s? And it was C, South San Francisco Street. Yeah, and, and one of the most you know, entertaining and interesting aspects of doing all this oral history research on Flagstaff's African-American community is there was these insights into kind of what life was like in the 30s or the 40s through the 60s in Flagstaff for this community. Um, it was a segregated, not officially segregated town, but there's a railroad that goes through the center of town, north and west in Flagstaff. North of the downtown is kind of really beautiful old quaint homes. And then the south side of the tracks was considered the barrio. And that's where a lot of 
uh, Mexican American or, uh, you know, Latino folks would live. And that was also where the black community lived. There were some Native American folks in the neighborhood as well. And so it was considered kind of the barrio, the, the poorer neighborhood. But there are some fascinating aspects to the, the South San Francisco Street was this kind of bustling uh, commercial district for that community. And many of them would frequent the Elks Club, which was the, you know, the fraternal order uh, among the black community. It was the only bar that served alcohol that allowed blacks in uh, Flagstaff at the time. So the Elks Lodge would have live music. It would be this kind of uh, really cool spot. And nearby was Charlie Scoto's Pool Hall, which was another place that they would maybe grab some beers next door and then go play pool for a while, migrate back to the bar. So really fascinating things. I should note, it wasn't all, uh, it was a red light district as well. But while I've mentioned the device component of it, which I was, I guess, found more interesting, there's also um, uh, a lot of church going and uh, church orienting a lot of the social life during the weekend, I should note as well. So um, pretty, pretty fascinating uh, history on that front. But uh, yeah, the Sunnyside neighborhood was actually um, there was kind of some dissonance or some friction between the Latino community in Flagstaff and the black community. A lot of times the Latinos aspired for whiteness, right? And, and saw themselves as, as a cut above African-Americans. And so Sunnyside in some ways was segregated from blacks being able to live there. And so uh, it became South San Francisco Street was kind of the haven for that area. Um, and now the, uh, the region still has some of that. Dunbar School is still around. It's become... Uh, a black community center um, called the Murdoch Center. And so that, some of that history is still there, but now parts of the university, student housing are kind of overpowering that history in some ways. So it's, it's cool to remember it. Important. And, indeed it is. So, and I see people already know kind of, it's like, I'm the, the last question always is, how did you do? And I mean, it's like, and as Jeff stated, he got one out of 10 right, but learned lots of stuff. And that is honestly the best thing is that it doesn't matter how many you got right or wrong, because it's all about we now have the more stories to add to kind of our repertoire of just Arizona. So as we're out and about, um, I know even got, I got questions today from somebody who's like, hey, you know, over the summer, my family's going to start looking at Arizona history in a different way. Where should we go? So I can throw off, I think, some of these places for them to go visit as well, to just kind of learn another side of that history. It'll be cooler up there, too. So. And indeed, I know. That's why when DJ said his, his staff was up at um, Mother Road Brewery working on a new uh, a custom brew, I'm like, oh, they must hate that they're up in Flagstaff today. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Marshall, I was talking about this earlier, but because, Oh, you found it. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's a it's called Archive Ale, also from Mother Road Brewing Company. And it's about Katie Lee, who is kind of a local legend in northern Arizona. Um, and it's this beer that is meant to um it's a combination between Mother Road Brewing Company and the special collections at Northern Arizona University, where I did a lot of my research on the African American community. And so if you buy Archive Ale, it gives some of that money to the uh, archives in Flagstaff, which is kind of a cool purpose. It's a good beer. It's really strong, though. So, you know, be careful on that front. But uh, really tasty stuff. It's it's kind of just cool to see NAU's logo uh, on, on a beer. beer. Right, exactly. Yeah, so. Not enough, and I love she's also on front of a VW thing. Yeah, she looks rad. Huh? Like it, She it's does. Kind of, I mean, it's like, and the fact that she actually had a VW thing before they became hot and trendy when they were oh. like the ugly ducklings. But some yeah. of us were like, Oh my God, they're so beautiful because they are so awkward looking. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, go so mother road. yeah, exactly. I mean, we had to go mother road. So I'm thinking, I think I've got some projects I might hit them up with. Cause I think that would be kind of fun to see what else we can do. Yeah, absolutely. So Jack, thank you so much for coming on and sharing some of your past research. And, and, and so what is your daughter's name that we got photobombed? Yeah. Lena, Lena Ann Reed. So uh, she was born on New Year's Eve. She's a little party baby. So. Oh uh, my yeah. gosh. <laughs> yeah, There's so going to be exciting. lots of parties for her birthday. How nice. Yeah. And thanks for having me. It was really fun to talk this history. Great to meet all of you. Thanks for your active participation here. It's been fun to see the comments. And uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, if you're interested, check out the book. And uh, we'll, yeah, we'll talk soon sometime. Sounds good. All right, Jack. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Have a great rest of your night. Um, you can now go tuck your daughter in and maybe read her a story. 
I love it. Yeah. All right. I'll tell her about tonight. You know. <laughs> All right. Have a great night. All right. Thanks, Marshall. Have a good one. You do the same. Oh my gosh. You know, big round of applause for Jack. What? A, I mean, I love the variety of questions and that of course, you know, some of them were kind of designed to be a little on the, Oh, you know, it's going to mislead you to think the wrong or answer, but you know, the goal is that we all get to have fun. And so, all right. So we're going to wind up the, oh, so now in case some of you that are new to the show didn't know what to expect, now you really know why you should share because you kind of never really know where the stories are going to go and what's going to happen. But Jack hit it out of the ballpark. So thank you so much for testing our knowledge on hitchhiking and African-American history in Northern Arizona on this historic day of Juneteenth becoming a national holiday. And so now we're gonna do a bit of show and tell. So, oh, and let's see. Oh, and oh, the green screen does a little bit of wonkiness with it, but if we do that. So, you know, I have a whole cookbook collection. And so when I was looking for mascots, I was kind of amazed that we really don't have any citrus-based mascots that I know of. I mean, I was trying to find if there was a lemon or a lime or an orange, but I didn't find anything. But so then I grabbed this cookbook and I love how so in the summertime. So this cookbook is from 1976 and was published right here in Phoenix. But I love things like the patio orange ring, which, of course, is a lovely jello salad with some lemon juice some honey, some salt, some cream cheese, some orange juice, and some pineapple. And then it has a lovely sauce poured on it that is eggs, honey, lemon juice, and more sour cream. So that way you only have to heat up a little bit of water, but you can make a, del <laughs> a, a delicious patio orange ring. So I might actually try to whip one of those up. And then I love there's also a Paradise Valley grapefruit ambrosia which is grapefruit, sugar, dates, pecans, and coconut. So a little twist on the ambrosia salad that I grew up with in the Midwest. And then ending with a happy day salad, which again is a lovely jello salad. And it includes beets, orange juice, mayonnaise, avocado, and lemon. I bet that was such a horrifying color with that avocado and mayonnaise <laughs> with the beets submerged in it, or I guess suspended in it would be a better term. So, you know, and you can find all kinds of citrus recipes. And I know I've got a freezer full of lemon juice because <laughs> I <like how> Pam <laughs> is like, none of that is, the, is my fave. And, you know, but jello salads just have such a beautiful look to them, but I don't necessarily want to eat them. But all right. So next week we have a really exciting week because we have Justin or some of you may know Justin as Justin Deeper Love, who is a tucson based drag king who has been actually traveling around the state recently so there's gonna be all kinds of fun stories from all over arizona with justin deeper love being our very special guest next week now remember if you have any questions stories comments um if you don't get them in the chat before we finish you know you are always welcome to email me throw me a note on instagram or even good old fashioned email works as a great way. So, I mean, I actually was able, oh my gosh, we have some really great guests coming up. Ah, you know, that's one of the fun things of just reaching out. So, oh, just hardly wait for July because we've got some amazing stuff on the road. All right. So as we get ready to end the night, we are going to end with... My friend Chris and Cole, they did that intro video. Um, as always, PJ always comes up with something that connects to the story that we're telling. And so that was so beautiful. So I'm intrigued to see what he comes up with for next week. That's always the fun part. As well as then we're going to leave you with Mr. Hose Orgastrotica. He is a sunny slope boy who now lives on the East Coast and has his own orchestra. 
And so we're going to end with some of his music to some found film footage from right here in Arizona. So everyone, I wish you all an amazing evening and stay cool and good night. Oh, 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 oh,